The program is provided as an educational service by Petronovich Pew and Company, LLP, and Hoag Fenton. The information discussed by our panel is an overview only and should not be construed as legal or professional advice. We recommend you consult a licensed professional before taking any specific action. Lastly, please submit any of your questions you may have using the chat function. We will try to get through as many questions as time permits. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Ron Sare, Business Development Director at PP and Co. Once again, as Wen said, welcome to the PP and Co. Hogue Fenton Joint Webinar Whip It Good, utilizing WIP schedules to gain valuable insights. Uh, please mute yourselves, keep yourselves muted to give the speakers an opportunity to uh, present. You know, as you know, uh, many of us are at home, there's kids, there's dogs, there's gardeners, there's construction, yay. Uh, so please keep yourself muted. As Wen also said, this will be recorded and a copy of the presentation and the recording will be sent to everybody on the, uh, on the webinar. Please put all your questions in the chat box. Um, I'll be monitoring the chat and we'll get to as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. Um, well, as I said, we're very fortunate to have two construction industry experts to lead us through this presentation. Gino Ashley from Hoke Fenton and Matt Hennigan from Petrinovich Pew and Company. Um, Matt is an audit manager, CPA, and certified construction industry financial professional and chair of the construction industry practice group at Petrinovich Pew and Company. Matt works with privately held construction contractors of all sizes and types, providing audit accounting, tax planning, and business consulting services. Matt has spent years learning and teaching accounting topics that are unique to contractors, both internally at PP and Co and through active participation in local and national construction organizations. Uh, Gino Ashley is a veteran trial lawyer and chair of Hoke Fenton's construction practice group. Gino's experience ranges from bet the company lawsuits with multi-million dollar outcomes, to prosecuting and defending actions arising out of contracts, unfair business practices and construction disputes. He has chaired numerous bench and jury trials in addition to helping guide clients through arbitrations and settlement. He's a member of the Santa Clara County Bar Association and has taught course, uh, courses for lawyers on mechanics lien law. He's active in the community having served on, served on numerous boards over the past 20 years, including Junior Achievement, Board of Trustees of the Morrell Catholic High School, numerous sports organization, and he coaches Little League Baseball and has coached lacrosse for many years. With that, Gino, you want to take it away? Uh, sure thing, Ron. Thank you for that kind introduction, and thank all of you for uh, taking the time today to um, be here for this. You know, when this um, opportunity first presented itself, the idea that um, I would help present a topic about forecasting and cash management, I thought, why would you ask a litigator that? You know, guys like me went to law school for a reason. We don't like to deal with cash management, particularly and forecasting. But the truth of the matter is it's more than that. It's about information. And that is exactly what I deal in uh, when I'm counseling clients uh, before litigation, uh, during litigation. It's all about how well you keep track of your information and manage it and when it comes to construction, and I've been doing construction litigation of all kinds for 27 years, it is um, all about the evidence. That's how I prove my claims. And so what I need is for clients, and what I love is when they have detailed records and I can prove to a fact finder or to opposing party that what we have in our records is accurate, clear, and compelling. And that's how that's how you, uh, you defeat claims, it's how you win claims, and more importantly, it's how you avoid claims. Uh, but I know you don't wanna hear about that. Nobody wants to call their litigation attorney. I understand that, uh, we're a problem solver. Uh, what Matt has developed is a tool that not only helps you avoid problems and solve problems, but frankly, maximize your efficiency and ultimately profitability in the way you run. So uh, I, I, I've enjoyed, uh, working with Matt to learn more about the tool that he and PP and co have developed PP and co many of you know I hope they're, they're fantastic people in a fantastic firm uh, and I'm privileged to be able to present with them 
Uh, and so with that, um, Matt, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Um, thank you for your attention, everyone. Thanks, Gino, and again, a shared honor to share this with you as well. Um, and then also thank you, Ron, for the introduction. Um, I have always been a big, loved construction. I love to just watch buildings getting built and when I was, you know, going to college, I was between engineering and accounting and the math was easier in accounting. So that clearly won. Um, so that's where we are today. Um, so we, what are we really going to talk about today? We want to talk about our best practices for WIP reporting and that we want to really build the schedule um, and showcase what we can do with just our baseline WIP schedule, how our accounting function and our job operations function kind of meet in the middle um, and produce this financial reporting tool. Um, we're gonna go through some effects of change orders and estimate changes and how one small change or big change, what kind of effect that has on the rest of the financial statements as well as the company's job schedule. And then once we can, once we build that baseline schedule, we're gonna look at how can we upgrade it. So what we're then gonna do is go into how we can build out forecasting and cash management within our WIP schedule. So the work in process is the schedule that really tells the contractor's story. Um, and that's really important because when you have when you have a financial statement, you know you can read through it, um, you can read the notes, but really the the real meat of a contractor's financial is going to be in their job schedule. That's going to tell you what they did during the year, where they may have struggled, where they excelled, um, and you really want to build it out so that it's a bragging tool almost, um, and not only do we want to use it externally for reporting, but we want to be actually building something that we can use internally as a management tool and not just have, you know, accounting prepared either every month or close to year end when the accountants come knocking and asking for documents. We want to be able to build something that everybody within the company is using on a monthly basis. That's including superintendents, PMs, accounting, uh, CFOs, management, uh, owners of the company, any decision makers, everything. And that's where we get into where we be put ourselves into that best in class contractor space. So what goes into the WIP schedule? It's all about the long-term contracts. And that's why construction accounting is different from normal accounting where you're just selling goods and services. We're gonna have long-term contracts that they may last two to three years long. We don't want to wait for three years to start recognizing revenue. We have to recognize revenue as the job is completed. So we use percent of completion for a long-term contract. If we have a two-year contract, the end of year one, we're 50% complete. We want to be recognizing 50% of the revenue. Um, and that kind of is our building blocks into this schedule. Um, so the contracts can either be lump sum, lump sum, mostly dealing with fixed fee. Um, we have time and materials as well, but those are usually displayed separately as those are more of a service contract. Um, and then there's some new considerations under the new ASC 606 revenue recognition standards. And I'm not gonna go too in deep on that because you could teach a whole class on that all by itself. But basically it's each job has its own performance obligation that can be separate. Um, we usually don't get into splitting too many jobs until you get into the 
really large contracts. Um, but the gist of it is that each job has its own distinct performance obligation, one building that you're delivering to a job owner. So here is our baseline WIP schedule. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you have either seen these in financial statements or have worked with either our firm or other firms to um, kind of put these together. But so when we get into it, we have all these different columns, A, B, C, D, all the way through M and L, M and N. Um, so we're gonna start with A and B, and that is our contract revenue and our estimated cost to complete. So contract revenue, that one's pretty easy. What's the, what's the number that we have agreed with the job owner on the contract? Um, that's black and white usually until we start adding change orders and everything else. Um, and then we have our total estimated cost to complete. And this is kind of the most important number, I would say, in our entire WIP schedule. Um, and it really just drives almost everything about the WIP schedule as well as our financial reporting as a contractor. So we really want to focus on having really good total job estimates. Um, because if you're, if you're changing your estimate constantly or monthly um, with really wild swings, and we're gonna see that later in this presentation, but it's gonna have a huge impact on um, our financial reporting. So then as we move across, we, we have our gross profit and that's total gross profit. That's if we completed that job for that amount of revenue and those estimated costs. And then we have C and D, and these are our current progress. So D is where we're going to list our cost of revenues that we've incurred on this job to date. So if we look at the first job down, 20003, we're estimating that that job is going to cost us $16.5 million, and we're $7.7 .7 million completed. Now that number is basically what we hope is a pure output from our accounting software or whatever the contractor uses to track job costs. And that was another important as the theme of today pretty much is our data integrity and making sure that we're putting in good data in every aspect of this and you'll see what that can achieve. Um, so. Once we have that 7.7 .7 cost of revenues incurred to date, we're able to calculate how much revenue we're gonna earn on that job. So if you look over at column G, in that first job, we're 47% complete. We're gonna recognize 47% of the revenues of that job, which is 9.2 million. And then, as we keep moving down the list a little bit, we have column H, and this is going to be our contract billings to date. And that plays into our next two columns of whether we're gonna be creating an asset or a liability on the balance sheet from this job. Um, so on, we're still on that, looking at that first job. If we have 8.9 million billed to date, we said we are recognizing 9.2 million, but we've only billed 8.9. So we have some work that we haven't billed for. While technically it creates an asset, we're, we're really hoping that we can get ahead of our billings and not be behind on a job because um, having a big amount of the costs and estimated earnings and excess of billings, which is the asset account, the billings and excess of costs and estimated earnings is the liability side. Um, but if we have a lot of costs and estimated earnings in excess, which is we've earned more revenue than we billed for, the readers of the financial statement, that's usually the first place they're gonna look. So on that first job, if we see that we're 290,000 almost under build, 
um, it's going to raise a question because why why would we as a company want to be underbilled for doing work that we can um, legally bill for that we haven't yet? Are we just slow in our billings? Is there is there a big issue with this contractor or uh, this job or the job owner? Are they telling us they don't want to pay it even though we've done the work? Um, so that's kind of the issues you get into when you start seeing those high numbers. Um, and then in column J, we have if we build more than we've earned from percent of completion, we're going to have a liability on the balance sheet. And while it's a liability, we tend to like seeing a lot of billing in excess just because, um, you know, you get the cash ahead of time and you are able to do more things with the cash. You know, we'll get into that later of the cash management as well. Um, and just making sure that we're able to bill ahead and making sure it's while we can bill ahead, we want to also make sure that we're tracking all of our contract costs. We can get into some situations where we're billing, we think it's 75% done, but our accounting software or our accounting team or PMs have been haven't entered any subcontractor invoices. And so it's going to show up that we are way we haven't earned that much on the job or we're not as far as we actually are. Um, so that's an issue you can run into on the billings in excess. And then as we get to column L, K and L, these are amounts that are gonna go on the financial statements and the general ledger for the current year. Um, so the way we get our current year revenue and costs for each job is we're going to take our amounts that we've earned to date and we the costs we've incurred to date in C and D, and we're going to subtract any prior year amounts. So as something with long-term contracts is obviously you will have recognized revenue and costs in the prior year. So in order to get our current year amounts, we have to take what we've done to date subtract out what we did in the prior year, that gives us our current year amounts. Um, and another thing we can see sometimes with the current year amounts is if there's a big swing in those job estimates that we talked about, we could be in a situation where we're de-recognizing revenue because we recognize too much in the prior year based on an incorrect estimate. So we'll, we'll see that in a little bit. And then M and N is our backlog. So that is how much of those jobs do we have remaining to earn or how much cost do we have remaining? So that's another really important number for readers of the financial statements. You can show that, you know, maybe you knocked it out of the park in 2020, but your backlog is only has like $10 million in it. That's gonna be a little concerning. People want to know that one, you are successful in the current year and you can keep it going. Um, so that is all the current year work without any new signed contracts in the next year that you still have. So it can even be better if you've signed a lot of contracts early on in the beginning of the year. Um, so this kind of just summarizes a couple of the really important features, those contract totals, the um, costs or billings in excess. And like we said, you know, the high amounts of costs in excess can sometimes mean issues with certain jobs. It doesn't always, but um, it's just one of those things that can be a red flag. And then the prior year's amounts is always really critical as well to making sure that your WIP rolls forward um, from prior years. And so we always wanna make sure that if a job was in progress last year, that it's either included in the current year or the, the current year in progress or the current year completed. If there are some jobs that are falling off or aren't included this year or a job that was um, should have been added, then we're gonna have issues when we try to tie to the general ledger and finish our financial reporting. So then we get into the change orders and job estimates and 
kind of the impact then the, that those can have on our financial reporting. Um, and what we really see a lot is like one small change can have a huge impact um, where the people that are making those changes don't realize how big the swings can be on the other end of that. So um, with change orders, we always want to make sure that we're not recognizing revenue until the change order is approved, because then you get into an issue where, let's say we add the change order because we're 90% certain they're going to sign. We did a little handshake deal. Um, and I'm sure Gino can speak more to this later as well. But now we're going to be in a situation where we may recognize those costs and we recognize the revenue, but then job owner turns around and says, oh no, we're not paying for that. That was our other guy that said yes to that. I'm not saying yes. Um, and we're gonna have to de-recognize that revenue again, a big negative mark on the job schedule. And so keeping track of change orders on the job schedule also will show you what's coming down the pipeline in the next months and two. So here is an um, example of what a change in job estimate can show. So even though overall a like $500,000 change in estimate is somewhat minor in terms of a $6.5 million job, if we have two jobs that we have side by side, it's gonna really affect jobs that are close to completion. Um, so looking at job A and job B, we both, we have two $10 million jobs with $6.5 million estimated costs. And current year revenue, we would have recognized 200,000 in 9.5 because the job B were closer to completion. Once we change that estimate, we have a derecognition of only 142 on job A, which we may be able to make back up in future years. Um, but job B, we're gonna have a huge derecognition of 678,000, just because that job's close to completion. We've already recognized so much of that job and backpedaling now has a huge impact on that job. So now we've kind of you know, built that baseline. Um, of our web schedule and making sure that it rolls from prior years and making sure that everything, all of our data inputs are working well together. How do we upgrade our web schedule? So what we want to add to this is ways that we can use the web schedule internally as a decision-making tool instead of just a financial reporting tool that accounting puts together each month. Um, so what we're gonna do is we wanna add forecasting to that and we wanna add advanced cash management tools to that as well. So what's our goal with forecasting? We're able to inform decision-making and drive improvement. We're able to do trend monitoring. We have a dynamic and constantly updated tool. We're able to monitor return and better compete against some of our um, same size competitors, and we can use it for better planning for things like equipment and labor usage. And once again, this all centers around making sure that data coming in and the data usage of this is top notch. So what we wanna do with forecasting is in our job schedule, we, you know, we have back to those, that first job we were looking at, we have the opportunity the, um, to really predict out however X number of months that we want to for each job. And the people that are gonna be holders of that information are your PMs. And so that's why we want to really utilize them, um, not just in making sure that all the costs and all the billings are entered, but really giving us that future impact that we can um, use for decision-making. So if we look down below, we can, um, we can predict out six months of costs and billings 
forecasting. So on that first job, we know that maybe month three and month four are going to be a little high. And maybe that's because that's when some of the materials are coming in or that's when we're going to need to use the equipment. Um, can we shift certain things around from other jobs to write that to steady that impact or are we going to be okay um, to do that? What we want to be doing is we want to be planning now for six months in the future so that we don't get to April 30th and we know that we're going to need to spend $800,000 on this one job May 2nd. Um, so we're able to see if we have a surplus or deficit of man hours that we can solve in advance. And what can we do to mediate, to um, fix these issues as we come across them? Can we accelerate our billings and increase our cash flow? Um, and so that's what we're able to put into the WIP schedule here. We plan our costs, we plan our billings for every single job. And so once we have that good data by job, we can put the entire WIP schedule into a summary forecast. So this is gonna tell management, okay, we have in month one, we're gonna be billing 3.1. We have contract costs of 2.7. Gross margins are gonna be 424,000. We may have to spend a little bit in SGNA, and we're gonna have 9,000 negative EBITDA. Now, do we, is that okay? Or do we need to fix that now? We can do that with this information. Um, and so this is also centered around making sure that the company is having monthly PM meetings with everybody involved in this, that everybody's kind of being held accountable for reporting on their jobs. This relies on, like we said, relies on the data coming in and relies on all the PMs to really um, making sure that they're putting forth the most accurate and useful data and the monthly results and future month results are presented for every job. And it's kind of, it's going to give each PM an opportunity to also speak on their jobs and hold everyone accountable. And that's going to build, um, one, it builds buy-in from everyone. It doesn't, you know, the, the, the uh, job team and the PMs aren't, they know how their work affects everything else. And same with accounting and everybody's kind of working together and holding this accountability together. And so a lot of decisions and situations that can cost contractors significantly each year can be mitigated and planned for. So, and then once we've really started digging into forecasting future months out and um, developing these tools, we can also take a look at our cash management and where we're gonna be as a cash position each month. Um, so obviously cash management is key to performance and long-term viability of any contractor and healthy cash position allows the contractor to grow as well as take on more work. You're, allow yourself more opportunities. And it's, um, everybody that is a reader of the financial statements, that's another big thing that they'll look for. So what, do, what can we do to improve our cash positions? Can we accelerate receipts? Can we decelerate payments? Um, and doing really good planning for our capital outlays of property and equipment or other things like bonuses, um, that type of big cash outlay. And so, you know, one thing we can do, can we negotiate with our job owners to pay us every 30 days and then go to our material suppliers or our subcontractors and agree to pay them every 45? We now just allowed ourselves 15 days of cash, free cash float on that job. So, this allows the contractors to really take control of their cash procedures um, and negotiate, like we said, with both subcontractors and job owners to create these positive cash positions. So when we were looking at the WIP schedule before, we were saying the cost in excess of built, the cost and estimated, estimated earnings in excess, those are gonna be where we're behind on billings. 
and the billings in excess of cost, that's going to be where we're ahead of billings. That's where we're more in control on that job. We're getting way more cash than we're spending. Now, one thing that we want to be wary of, like we said, we usually like to see a lot more billings in excess because that means contractors taking in a lot more cash. But one thing that we really need to also keep in mind and using forecasting and cash management on the WIP schedule really helps to um, take control of this and see this as well, is that we wanna make sure that we're not going too deep into job borrowing. Um, so even though we're gonna be well over build, if we can't set up a, a consistent stream of cash coming in, that's gonna come back to hurt us in the end. Because like, if we look at that job about middle way down 2105, and it has billings in excess of 2.6 million, that's all great. And we are able to collect that 2.6 million on that job. And we haven't really expend that much cost. The problem is gonna be, we still have 2.8 million remaining costs to complete that job, but we're only gonna be able to bill for another 677,000. So if we don't have a healthy cash position, we're gonna be in a very um, tight place getting that job done if we don't have either A, a lot of cash on hand playing conservatively or future jobs that we're continuously able to build ahead of. So it's kind of, you know, you want to be billing ahead, but you also want to be doing it as a balancing act. So then in addition to our forecasting, um, we can really build out our cost forecasting that we looked at previously, as well as our net, what our net cash position is going to be on every single job. Um, so if we, you know, we can plan for which months we wanna do those capital outlays, which months we know when we're gonna to have to pay taxes, do we want to try to switch some of our big spending months on that job around? Can we talk to the job owner and say, maybe we'll do, we'll push something up into month two so that we know, because we know we're gonna have a lot more cash on hand from the other jobs as well. Um, so those red highlighted boxes, we can see 2109, we're going to have a huge amount of costs on that job in month four. Is, do we think that's going to be an issue or do we need to start planning right now um, to either fix that or do we think that that's going to be okay? Are we going to be able to go 627,000 negative on that one job for our cash? And the, once again, we circle back to this theme that's just the data in and the data integrity tells us what decisions we can be making now for month four, in this example, at least. So, and then what are some other opportunities that our improved cash position now allows us to do? We can reduce our leverage, we can pay down some of our debt and have an even healthier balance sheet and financial statements. Um, another thing is we're not gonna be in a place where we're gonna be forced to settle with a bigger subcontractor, a bigger general that's gonna try to bully us um, into taking a settlement. If we have a very healthy cash position and we have you know, a $1 million bill outstanding to them and they turn around and say, no, we're not gonna pay it, take us to court. Um, we're gonna be able to wait that out as somebody who has a really healthy cash position. And we can say, okay, cool, we're legally entitled to this and we're gonna come after you for legal fees because nothing you're doing is, um, well, I don't wanna speak on the legal side, but, um, you're not in a position where you have to take a $500,000 settlement just to get the money. And then you're able to fund special projects. 
um, and research new product lines without being in a position where you have to spend all available cash on projects. Um, and you're able to manage the float to create investment opportunities. And you know, while we always like to see conservative approaches with cash management, you know, there can be really conservative investment opportunities and a couple percentage points on cash that's just sitting in the bank can be a lot on the on the income statement at the end of the year. Um, so in conclusion, our goal is to be creating better information and a better informative tool that gives the decision makers of the company you know, a full hand to play with. Um, and we're building improved employee buy-in to the overall company strategy through expanded involvement. You know, it's the superintendents, it's the PMs, it's accounting, it's all of management, everybody buying in together to create this, um, this data and this tool. And then the next step is where you go from that. Now you are able to create improved internal processes and create process mapping. So, you know, if you want to, you start doing some of these procedures and you want to keep doing it, now then's the time to really, okay, let's get it mapped. Let's get it as our company policy that we're going to meet every month with everybody. And here's the things that are going to, we're going to go over. Um, so I think that's all I had. And I'm going to kick it over to Gino. All right. Thank you. We'll do um, questions at the end. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. For those of you who may have a lot of questions uh, for Matt, uh, we'll provide plenty of time for that at the end. Um, my job here really is to put uh, a finer point and an exclamation point behind the importance of having this kind of accurate and consistently accurate and thorough and detailed um, information at your disposal. And I'm going to use the word information. It's, 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 it's real-time information about the project. It's historical information about the financial well-being of any project. And as Matt emphasized, it's the ability to forecast and build up cash reserves. And that's, that's, that's critical. Because I want to go back to something that I saw on one of the first slides that Matt prevented. The work in progress schedule tells the contractor's story. And when, uh, when somebody, a contractor or a subcontractor or a lender or a surety comes to me, that's what we wanna know. That's where we look first. What is the contractor's story? And as a general contractor, uh, the more clearly and accurately you can tell your story, the better off you are, certainly for, for business reasons. And you know, I, I'm also a business owner, so I understand that part, but where I get involved is, is is where people start to see the erosion of, of, of profit and financial viability because there are problems. Um, and in that arena, information is king. It is the best currency, to pardon the pun, but it is. Uh, it's important not only for, for all the reasons Matt has said, and he's touched on some of the things I wanna talk about, all of it about maximizing profit in projects and making them successful, but it puts you in the best possible position you can be in as a general contractor or even a subcontractor to defend claims, to bring claims successfully, but most importantly, to avoid claims because that's what you ought to do. Um, and uh, I know I said I was a litigator, but I spend a lot of my time working with, with people in the construction business trying to avoid claims. Uh, in the breakout chat, I had an opportunity to share uh, a war story, and I'm not up here to tell a lot of war stories, but uh, I was hired uh, along with one of my colleagues uh, by a large general contractor who had the general contract to build a portion of the new Bay Bridge extension. And we were hired to help process a change order, to write it, to develop it. Um, and I can tell you, we earned a lot of fees on it. The change order was for 50 million bucks, so I guess that's why they... <laughs> They hired outside counsel to do it. And for general contractors, query whether you can uh, build that under your general conditions as overhead and profit, I don't know. But um, the fact of the matter is that 
kind of information is what we look to to help make sure projects are healthy. Because the end of the day, all you're caring about, everybody, everybody on this call who's involved in a project is that the project gets delivered on time and on budget. And we all know that budgets, budgets change. But in order for the budget to change and have everybody comfortable with it, you need to have this kind of information available. You need to be able to process change orders correctly. Um, generals need to be able to understand why the subs are submitting a change order. They need to be sure that the change order truly isn't a scope and a scope change as opposed to a oversight somewhere along the line. And you need to be able to justify that to the owner and more importantly, to the lender when they're involved. Um, I can't tell you how often I get involved uh, in with in construction projects because of what ultimately is a lack of attention to strict work in progress schedules and frankly, the inability to deal with the ensuing cash crisis. Matt, Matt said this, uh, if, if you're in a strong cash position, uh, you're in a much better position to thoroughly vet and fairly resolve claims as they come along. Too often, if you, um, if you don't have this information at your disposal, if you're not on top of your work in progress, if you haven't forecasted correctly and you don't have appropriate cash reserves, um, you don't have a lot of leverage. The reality, I mean, you might have legally, I can give all kinds of legal reasons why you're right and why you're, and they're wrong and why they shouldn't have to pay this. The fact of the matter is you have to be able to withstand the bump in the road financially that it takes to process it without disrupting progress on your project. A um, couple of key uh, issues just coming from experience that come up uh, where we really need to know what our work in progress is like. First of all, we have billing issues, right? First and foremost, one is, um, is making sure that the um, subcontractors are billing correctly. You know, most on a big project, it's usually some sort of percentage of completion. Well, you need to have detailed work in progress schedules to understand uh, and recognize whether a subcontractor is appropriately billing. Are they front loading their contracts? You need to identify that first. Um, two, um, when you're getting when you're submitting a payment application and then it's being paid uh, by the owner, uh, believe it or not. I've been involved in plenty of claims where everything seems to be going fine, um, but the subcontractor starts alleging, wait a minute, um, I'm gonna hit you with a prompt payment schedule be, uh, violation under prompt payment statutes. Everybody should know that if you're a general contractor, the prompt payment statutes in California, unless, unless your contract provides otherwise, is you gotta pay the subs within seven days of getting paid. Well, you need to be able to make sure as a general that the payment that you receive from the owner includes everything that the subcontractor is billed for. That just means people have to be organized and be on top of their work in progress um, because the payment, prompt payment schedule penalties can be a big pain in the neck. Um, and then of course, there's the dreaded mechanics link uh, that can ensue when there's disputes between subs and GCs and of course the GC and their owner. All of this information we hope avoids ever having to get involved in a mechanics link because if you've been a general contractor and the subs start leaning a property, the owner, the lender, the sureties are all very, very unhappy. And by the way, just to remind you on mechanics liens, you need uh, a mechanics lien is, is proven and entitles the lien holder to the reasonable value of the, of the improvement, their service, their contribution to the work of improvement. It's not your contract price. Uh, and you need to be able to prove the reasonable value. And as a lawyer who's brought several and defended several mechanics lien claims, where's the first place you look for evidence in this regard? You want to see the job history and a good record of work in progress that, and you can tell that the contractor has managed this correctly and has thorough records, makes the, the defense of an improper mechanics lien pretty straightforward, and it's essential to prove your mechanics lien if you're, if you're bringing one. Change orders, again, work in progress is critical. Uh, having a good work in progress schedule and, an, and, an abil uh, um, and cash forecast is critical in your ability to 
understand if a change order is needed and if a change order is appropriate, and that's at every level. And an owner who's getting a request for change order from a general contractor that's comprised of several requests for change orders from a group of subs, uh, if you wanna get that approved, it's gonna go a lot smoother with a lot less frowns if you have detailed and you can demonstrate that you've managed work in progress and you understand exactly where you are, you can improve exactly why this is a change in scope and you can assure and allay concerns of the lender and the owner based on your forecasting of what this is going to end up costing us when we're done. Because as I said at the outset, most owners that I know and lenders wanna make sure that project, there's no surprises at the end. They want projects delivered on time and they want projects delivered on budget. Um, I wanna just conclude, I wanna leave plenty of time for, um, for questions because uh, I don't wanna come up here and tell war stories and scare people into going back and refining their, the way they do business. But it is, uh, I hope that um, everybody from this takes away how important it is um, for all of the reasons said to be on top of every project, to be managing work in progress correctly with as much detail as you can and do all the forecasting uh, that Matt has suggested. Um, you need to, uh, helps for all the reasons I said, and it provides you, hopefully, if you've done this, um, gives you the resources to be able to deal with claims because that is, as I said, is a big problem you, for a lot of contractors on a lot of projects that get out uh, in front of their skis um, they start being in a position where they don't have leverage because they don't have the economic wherewithal to withstand the dispute. And so with that, um, I would like to open it up uh, for questions, uh, questions for me or for Matt. Um, I wanna thank you all for your time and attention. I wanna thank Matt for his thoughtful presentation. It's been an education uh, for me and I hope it has for you. Thanks, Gino. Thanks, Matt. Um, Please uh, continue to keep yourself uh, muted. Um, we do have a question. Uh, when reporting, what are the impacts on the business of a sudden significant change in the anticipated profit on a single project? I was, I would, I don't, go ahead, Matt, if you have an answer. Oh, sorry, no, you go first. Well, I just wasn't clear on reporting. I, I reporting to who? believe um, it was, it's reporting on the WIP schedule. Sean, you want to clarify that? You want to unmute yourself real quick and clarify that, Sean Anderson? Yeah, I guess it could be multiple kinds of reporting, whether it's for financial taxes or, or otherwise. So what are the impacts on the business of a sudden significant change and the anticipated profit, hopefully up, on a single project. Okay, yeah, I can. Um, we wanna go back to the slides real quick. I think slide number 10. Um, so, and these, these two examples here are showing um, job estimates that are going in the opposite direction that we're hoping for, obviously our estimates are going up and in each of these jobs, we're going from a 65% or a 35% profit margin to a 30%. And, um, you know, that seems pretty small in hindsight, but then when you look at the actual impact, um, it's obviously going to impact us a lot more if we're closer to the end of the job. And the reason that is, is because if you look in job B, we've already recognized 95% of the job at that 35% at that profit margin. If we now have to go back to 30% profit margin, we now have to show that one job lost us $678,000 in the current year, even though we don't necessarily feel like it did with the way the billings and the costs worked out. With the way that we report it, that job shows a big loss for the current year. Now, if our profit margin was to go in the opposite way, this would um, 
show a lot more in um, the positive direction. We'd show, let's say, we would expect to make seven hundred thousand dollars if everything was going perfectly. We're now going to show that job at, with revenues of maybe one point five million with the same amount of costs that you've incurred during the year. So if you're closer to completion and the profit margin went down right at the end, you're gonna have a huge um, net income boost and that's gonna have some tax implications as well. So um, that's why it's usually good to make sure that your estimates are good. You don't wanna have that big tax hit at the end. Also, if you have, there's, um, there's a provision for long-term contracts called a look back provision. Um, and it's to prevent construction contractors with long-term contracts from what's called sandbagging a job for four years. And then, oh, our profit margin is actually 45% instead of the 20 we were reporting. If, you, if that happens, even if it was an honest mistake, um, you now have to go back and estimate your tax liability for every single year of that job. And you have to pay interest on what you would have paid on every single year. So if it's a five-year job, that year one interest, depending on the amount of income, that could be a huge in, uh, just interest amount you have to pay because of that. So there's- So just like in golf, don't sandbag. Yeah. So there's pluses and minuses on both swings of the gross profit um, there. And it's just always better just to make sure your estimates are as good as you can. I mean, obviously we know that it's gonna, it can change, but. Ron, do they give you the interest back if you reported the wrong way and gave them too much money? No. No. Uh, no. Um, but thanks well, for asking, Sean. But there's, a, I want to, I want to, the question, although I don't think the question speaks to what I want to say about it, but it invites, uh, it provides a great example of why um, having really good work in progress uh, schedules matters. Because um, if you're a general contractor and you have a uh, sudden change, uh, sudden and significant change in anticipated profit, that tells me that um, you may have a change in the budget and you may raise the concerns uh, when you're in your payment applications that might reflect some of this with the owners and or the owner's lender or a surety who's provided a payment or performance bond. And um, if you have the ability to demonstrate that yes, this has happened, but let's, I've got, I've got accurate forecast going forward. Um, I can explain why this has happened. I can explain how we're going to deal with it during the project. I can show you what the impact is gonna to be to schedule or overall budget. And I've got thorough forecasting that is reliable. It makes that conversation a lot easier. Matt, um... Of all the items dis that you discussed today, and it was a very thorough discussion, what's the most common shortcoming you see on a contractor's whip schedule that keeps it from becoming a good management tool? You know, I don't want to discount the accounting part of it or the tax part of it. They're all very important. Mm -hmm. People still have to run businesses. And right. as you pointed out, this whip schedule can be an important uh, tool for that. What do you see that's missing generally that would help a contractor make this a better tool? Um, I got to I think it's got to be the data inputs. Um, you know, if you you can have the best schedule built in the world, you can have the best person in charge of maintaining it. If they're not being given the right information, then it doesn't it's worthless as just as much as the piece of paper it's printed on. Um, and that, you know, it starts with everybody in the company, the PMs and putting everything correctly, tying everything to each job, you know, all of our analytics and all of our forecasting by job is not gonna, it's not gonna work if all of our total numbers and all of our to date numbers aren't being inputted correctly. And that, 
definitely needs the support of ownership, right? Of the the owner of the company has to right. enforce that, just like a lot of things in, in companies, the owner has to enforce it. But who typically is responsible for putting together the web schedule and 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 you know initially chasing down information and presenting it at a company? Um, I think, and I, I mean, it, it can vary by each contractor as well, but I think the majority of the um, responsibility is, you know, on the PMs and on accounting as well. But like you said, it's, it's if, if nobody's there to enforce that, then um, nothing gets done. Um, so that's kind of why one of the important aspects of it is that whole team buy-in um, and just everybody contributing and everybody seeing the fruits of that labor. Um, this is from Michael Grant. Uh, can you keep track of schedule changes on the WIP? If you see delays in the schedule, but no changes in the gross profit for these additional general conditions slash contingencies, wouldn't that be a red flag? Wait, sorry, I'm reading. Let me read that. Sure. Well, I'll start. Oh, well, Matt, you consider that because I think you're going to have some good things to say. I think it's it, it, it depends uh, whose hat you're wearing when you notice that, whether that's a red flag or not. I think if you're an owner and there's no change in the overall budget, even though there's a delay, um, and the owner is okay with the delay and the lender is okay with the delay. I don't know that it's a red flag. Certainly enough to make you wanna pay closer attention though as you go forward. Yeah, I would, I would say along the same lines, it's kind of each job is going to be different. Um, it's what you do with that delay as well. I mean, you, you wouldn't really if there's a big delay that you're still expending costs, so, you know, we would expect costs to go down, but if you can negotiate those delays, like Gino said, um, you, it may be a different circumstance for every job. But that's also why, you know, predicting the, this out and really getting a handle on what's coming down, we can, we know that job may be a problem and we're going to be monitoring it each month. Matt, on the on the really good work in progress schedules that you've worked with, uh, is the is the the project schedule included or tied to that? In other words, the duration of different scopes and the duration of the overall project. Um, I've seen some with it, some without. Um, would it be important? It kind of depends on who's looking at it. I think um, you're saying adding like this job has one year left, we expect. Is that? Well, correct. Usually or a project how long has been going on. Projects have um, where I see <laughs> from high end, high level litigation, it, it, you're either fighting about a schedule or budget. Um, and often they're linked. For example, like mm -hmm. the question here suggest if there's going to be uh, an extension of the schedule, that just means more general condition payments. So you would imply, uh, if not express, you would certainly imply uh, a scope a scope change in terms of overall budget. Um, and so I'm wondering, uh, right. I'm wondering the extent to which we can tie the work in progress schedule to the actual schedules to help predict for an owner in a bank uh, and a surety, give them whatever level of comfort can be provided when there's going to be delays. Yeah, I definitely think that it's um, could be a pretty good additive. Um, one thought also is if you do run into a lot of delays, it may raise more questions than you're willing to answer on those. Um, and sometimes it's easier to answer those questions without the the time frame that it's been going on um, on the schedule or not. Um, 
Yes. I don't know. I think that's kind of, I haven't seen too many on the actual reported financials that would list that, but I have seen some that um, show that on the internal. Hey, Gino, um, other than calling you or one of your fellow attorneys at Hope Fenton before they enter into a contract to dot all the I's and cross the T's. And as a tip, I've never regretted calling an attorney for advice before entering in a transaction. Okay, I've regretted not calling an attorney for advice before I've entered into a transaction. Um, and again, we've covered a lot of things and I know you've covered a lot of important items, but, but I'm, I'm big on what, what's the one takeaway that folks can walk away from this webinar knowing that the most important thing a contractor can do to minimize his or her probability of a dispute on a job is? Oh boy, <laughs> clear, uh, clear communication, clear unambiguous information about scope about budget and about schedule and overall relationships are critical um and so uh if if there is going to be uh an issue if you're a general contractor and you see it i i, I recommend that we bring it up as soon as possible because that builds trust um and it's going to be reckoned with somewhere along the line and the earlier, the better. And I, I do, now I'm gonna give a plug, you, Ron, you invited it. I have lots of clients that call me, I'm a litigator, but there are lots of clients that call me before we get into litigation, because as a litigator, I, I see all the problems are pretty good. And I've got law partners who are very good also at helping identify holes so that we can avoid problems, avoid litigation. Um, and we can provide good consult in terms of how to present a change order or how do I deal with a subcontractor that is not billing me correctly and how do you know, threats of uh, communications with, with sureties or lenders that are asking, need information, uh, we can help. Uh, and it's usually money well spent. And I, I will say I have some general contractors that will, uh, a lot of times if you have a general counsel, the general counsel will do a lot of that. Uh, but a lot of times, uh, if you don't, uh, that is something that a contractor can find a way to pass through as a part of their overhead and profit if their contractor provides for that in their general conditions. Do you know, the reason I brought it up is because in a prior life, I, I worked for real estate development and property management company. And again, I've never regretted calling the lawyers first. Um, it, it, it's 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 a good investment, money well spent, um, and no, I'm not getting a commission, and no, you didn't pay me to say this. It's just, I think it's just good, solid advice. We just have a few minutes left. I think the timing is perfect. Uh, if we could put up the slide uh, with Gino and Matt's co um, contact information, if anybody has any follow-up questions, uh, wants to talk to them, uh, in a minute, we'll have their information up. I'd like to thank everybody for attending. Here we go. Thanks, Winchu. Um, thanks very much for attending, everyone. Thank you for uh, to our presenters. They did a great job. Uh, thanks to the two firms, uh, Petrinovich Pugh and Company and Hogue Fenton, and to Sarah Lynn Winslow of Petrinovich Pugh and Company and Winchu from Hogue Fenton, their respective marketing gurus, who, as we all know, without them, this thing never would have, never would have come off. So uh, look for a follow-up email with the recording and the um, uh, slides in it. And um, everybody gets about two minutes left of their, or more of their life today, because we're ending a little early. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.